What's up, everyone? It's Kanan. It's Jesse. And we're the Geeky Saying Couple, and welcome to part three of this little video series we're doing talking about the members of Team Ruby and their character growth and character development from volume one to volume eight. We've already done Ruby and Weiss, and today we are doing Jess's favorite <laughs> member of Team Ruby, and I'm pretty sure her favorite character above all in Ruby, Blake Belladonna. And uh, Jess has got a lot of reasons why she loves Blake, and we have went over those in really two big videos. One, I believe, was why Bumblebee means so much to us, and of course when Blake was officially confirmed to be bisexual. That was mostly a Jess video. Um, I cried in both of them. <laughs> yep, she cried in both of them. Uh, the Bumblebee one we did very early in the cha uh, channel's history, so it's quite a ways back. Um, and it's funny, the 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 bi video came out at a very stressful time. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff that that seems to the go with. Uh, with all that, but, um, hopefully this one won't be as long as Weiss's, um, but Blake is a very interesting character, and we've learned through the years, whether it be fr through the show itself or other material like the comics, we've learned that for a lot of years we didn't know Blake for who she really was as far as her true um, personality. We learned that through the comics. So, um, I and Blake's character growth is kind of a bit easier to fully cover just because it literally... I don't want to say it's the easiest that, to, to really follow, but it's like each volume or each arc, really, between the Beacon, Mistral... And now Atlas Arc, it's kind of an ABC way to follow in a lot of ways. So before we cover the show proper, we're going to go back to the DC Comics because the because the parts of Blake's flashback in the DC Comics kind of predate Volume 1. Um, and we see that Blake used to be pretty feisty, you know? She was very... Um, she joked a lot. She smiled a lot more. Um, you know, um, she kind of had this attitude of, you know, nothing can harm me. I'm the best, you know. And reading that comic and seeing those flashbacks, it's kind of heartbreaking knowing what Adam turned her into. Um, and so by the time we see her in, say, the Black trailer in Volume 1... That's all we know of Blake. She was first marketed as the loner, the one that stays in shadows, you know, the kind of like a, a Batman like character, brooded in the shadows. And, you know, all, like I, Blake doesn't only come out at night, but it, it had that kind of character. Um, and she's like that at the very beginning, very soft spoken, but. Out of the other members, she's probably the least likely to speak up a whole lot. Um, very much a loner. Crow even called her the emo one at a, one point. Um, but it's only through certain events that we learn why Blake was like that. Um, and so very early in Volume 1, her and Weiss come to blows. Well, not really physical blows, but they have an argument. Uh, this is when Blake is confirmed to be a Faunus, even though uh, a lot of people kind of already put that together because there would be some scenes early in the volume where the bow would move and stuff like that. Um, but not only was she a Faunus, she was a member of the White Fang, and um, she runs away. And... Uh, Many believe, like, you know, this was the very first time we really saw Blake break down a little bit, especially uh, at the end of it when Team Ruby reunites and she does get a little emotional when Weiss says, you know, come to us, your teammates, you know, 
I don't care about what happened then, you know, just talk to us next time. Not him, the point in the sun. <laughs> um, even though when Blake told Sun everything, he kind of treated a few things as a joke. Like, hey, weren't you part of a cult? Yeah, he, <laughs> she didn't like that. Um, but through the, like, and then we get into like volume two when Blake is being very self destructive and wanting to stop Roman. To where she's not sleeping. Her grades are failing. She's not, you know, she's just, she's got bags under her eyes. Um, and so who's the one that breaks her out of that? Yang, of course. And um, <laughs> one of the first times where we see that, yes, Blake is definitely a cat faunus with the laser pointer. <laughs> um, we have one of the more, you know... One of the very first real touching Blake and Yang moments, that being burning the candle, which was more set up to give us more of Yang's backstory, but it was a way to show that Yang gets Blake. Yang is one of the few that fully understands her, and by the end of the talk, Blake is back out of her funk and back to how she is. Um, a lot of people call Volume 2 a very weird volume in that a lot doesn't happen. Um, and in what kind of ways it kind of is, it's that middle ground, it's, it's that middle season kind of thing where, yeah, a lot of stuff in the main story didn't progress, though it, it did in some small ways. And then you get into Volume 3 where um, Blake's biggest nightmare happens. And that is uh, the White Fang attacking Beacon and Adam finding her. Um, which later Weiss, you know, says, you know, she put up these walls around herself and all of a sudden those walls came tumbling down. She had ran to one place that she thought she'd be safe from her past and her past literally knocked down the door. Um, and so, of course, we've got Yang getting hurt. Uh, trying to save Blake from Adam, and then Blake running away. The Mistral arc is really funny when it comes to Blake, because a lot of f people watching the show kind of turned on Blake during this time, because they didn't like how she was portrayed, like, you know, slapping Sun and stuff like that. Um, though later, Aaron came out, I think it was Aaron and said that that was Adam's abuse coming out and Blake acting. I, I don't know. It, it, it was like a lot of people were shocked by that. Because um, at the time, a lot of people, you had people on one side who were saying, you know, Blake shouldn't have slapped him. And you had people who were like, he was eavesdropping on her and her father. Yeah. It's, a, he, <laughs> it's kind of um, because of the abuse from Adam, it's a trigger. Like... Yeah, it goes both. It, it fits both sides. Yeah, should she have slept? And probably not. But he was eavesdropping. So everything, things that she has built up inside, that's gonna be a reaction. Is like because he was invading her, pretty much her space by listening in. So kind of like the wall that she's built, trying to like invade through that, which and then that would course... create anger to make her do something like that. So it kind of to me kind of makes sense. It's a trigger. Then, of course, following her onto the boat in a as a hooded figure probably didn't help either. Um, but yeah, this... Yeah, Blake has ran. She is pretty much... She never plans to go back to her friends because she doesn't want to put them in danger. Um, and Sun thought she had ran off to pretty much... Being Take all, down the white fan. <laughs> all by herself, which was not what she planned on doing. She wanted to run away back to run away to, back to home and rest. And uh, even though she was very timid to do it, she wanted to see her family. And she thought they would turn her away, you know, because apparently they did get into a big argument, and she left with Adam because she thought her parents were weak, had given up on the white thing and all that, but they... Uh, Which Adam, I bet Adam made her believe that. Yeah. Though. But the big first thing that's kind of a little turning point for her is her parents welcomed her back with open arms. And throughout Blake's arc in 4 and 5 was mostly forgiveness. That was her story. 
Um, and also Sun teaching her to let her friends be there for her. Um, that was whole the whole point of, you know, you know, him saying if he could protect her again, he would, and he's sure Yang would do the same thing. Um, Blake has got this attitude right now that um, she doesn't like being alone, but to keep her friends safe, she's going to have to be, and she hopes that they hate her for living, living, leaving, because it would make it easier for uh, for her to stay away. Which is another um, po- important role of Sun being there, because we already, like, what the fr- everything that he has said, you know, he shows that, you know, he left his own team. He knows, like, and then he, but he knows he's the best one to say something to her. Like, you need to let them be there. He knows that he's not there for his. So, him being able to tell her that to make her understand, you know, you need to let your friends be there. Yeah. And throughout the, the whole time there, we have the whole story with Ilya. And like I said, part of Blake's story was forgiveness. Her parents forgave her. In the end, she forgives Ilya for what she did. And through that, Blake learns to forgive herself for the mistakes she made in the past And literally, it leads to her not only stopping the White Fang's attempted murder of her family, it leads her to pretty much leading the Faunus into Haven to stop the White Fang from destroying the school, which would make things even harder on the Faunus. And I know a lot of people criticize the attack she does on Adam at the end of Volume 5, the little... uh, double X handle move she does on him. But the whole point of that was to show that once Adam no longer had a grip on her, he wasn't as strong as he had been made to believe. His power came from fear. Um, That's the reason why he was able to easily beat her at Beacon. For one, she had been fighting all that time, but also she still was scared of him. And by Volume 5... She's went through this growth already that really doesn't make her scared of him anymore. She stood up to him. But also, she had the backing of her family, her fellow Faunus, and her friends there. That pretty much led um, her to topple Adam pretty easily, even though a lot of people didn't like it. um, Which even caused Adam to run away. Then, of course, the end of Volume 5, we have the ultimate show of forgiveness. And that is Ruby, Weiss, and even Yang welcoming Blake back. That was like, even though things were still not perfect between her and Yang, because they have a bigger arc together than what was going on right now, um, that was the final nail on her story of forgiveness. Now, Volume 6, we get into a lot of stuff. Um, The shadow of Adam is still over Blake, but... He doesn't have that, like, crippling hold that he did anymore. Which is why we start to see a little bit more of a play... The playful side of Blake come out during certain moments of this volume. Like, you know, where she teased about how they have... The heiress, the heiress to the Snee Dust Company with him, so they should easily be able to um, to to get back into At- to get to Atlas and all that. Um, but then by the end of Volume Six, we find out that those times that Blake has thought she's seen Adam, it wasn't a Illusion. Illusion. He was actually there. He's been stalking them the whole entire time, which was very eerie when you finally find it out. Um, And, of course, he waits until Blake is alone to attack her. Um, But at this point, he's no longer wanting to bring her back. He's wanting to kill her at this moment because he, she has pretty much... um, She humiliated him at Haven. She pretty much toppled the White Fang's trust in him and and their confidence in him, that he literally massacred 
an entire room full of White Fang members to keep his power. So, uh, we all know how this ends. Not, not really need to go too much into it because the time between Volume 6 and 7 was a, was not good for the Ruby Phantom. But finally, Blake and Yang defeat Adam. And within that, Blake is finally free to move on with her life. And we see that more in Volume 7. Even though I wish to this day we had seen it on camera. But we get that with the ceremonial cutting of the hair. It's been used in several forms of media. Mulan did it. Korra did it. When you, when a character with long hair severs their hair, it's, the be, it's supposed a to be a, a new beginning, a fresh start. And um, the song Touch the Sky, you can kind of uh, get that from the lyrics. Um, when all of Team Ruby jumps from the airship and goes down, Blake is smiling finally. She smiles a lot way more in this volume. She laughs a lot more. Um, though I think most of the times we see her laugh is from Yang telling her bad jokes. Um And Blake does more stuff in this that you wouldn't th- like. She goes on a dance club date with Yang, and even though showing that she doesn't really know how to dance, though it was adorable, you can't really <laughs> fault Blake for trying. I really wish we had seen how things went to see if Blake got the hang of it. But um, yes, we got to see a way more. We got, like, I never thought we'd see one of the Ruby Girls putting on makeup, and we saw Blake doing that. We just got to see sides of Blake we never thought we'd get to see in in Volume 7. Of course, things still went south by the end of Volume 7, but um, by Volume 8, though, that's where they really started to show that Blake has changed a lot. Blake was feisty again in this volume. You know, the whole teasing Weiss, you know, saying, isn't there, is there a building in Atlas that your family doesn't own? Uh, the, and, you know, did she figure that out before you did? <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. Like, Blake was just so animated. There was so much more, eight. like, yeah, emotion. Like, especially when they went through the tubes and she got, well, at the end, she's holding the wall going... I don't want to do that again. No, that wasn't the tube. That was them using Ruby's semblance to fly around. I thought it was the tube, too. No, no. When the tube, she came out and said, uh, like, I forgot what was said before that, but she comes out, she moves her hair out of her face, says, good, because I never want to do that again. <laughs> then when they rode around with Ruby's semblance, that's when she shakes and said, I also never want to do that again. Um, it's been it so long since so I've seen it, but I know she... It was her being a, a, cat, a cat as well, because <laughs> cats do that. Too much. <laughs> um, but yeah, and like, there were so many great things with Blake in Volume 8. Like, a lot of people complain that her and Ruby do not interact, and we got a major moment between Ruby and Blake. Like, the ladybug shippers loved it, but also people who like us, shit Bumblebee, and so we see Ruby and Blake as potential future sisters. You could see it as a a sister moment, you know. A, a, a bond. Yeah, yeah, a sisterly bond really starting to develop. Um, and, like, a lot of people complain that Blake went with Ruby and not Yang, but one, Blake didn't really fit the situation to go with Yang. Like, I th- I still think that Blake was more helpful to Ruby because they were infiltrating somewhere, and Blake is, like, the master infiltrator of the group. Um, but, like, we also saw more emotional stuff from Blake in this volume, whether it be her and Yang's reunion or her reaction to Yang falling, like, we are seeing way, a lot more emotional emotional range coming from Blake now. And, like, even going back to Volume 1, how she was in the very first few volumes, but by the time Team Ruby is made, she, she was already being a little bit more energetic after being around Yang and Ruby. You know, she took part in the whole bonsai thing and all that. She took part in the food fight. 
Like, you know, as Bumblebee shippers, we always say that Yang brought light to Blake's world, but also, in a lot of ways, Ruby and Weiss have as well. Um, Team Ruby has done so much for Blake that, you know, sometimes as Bumblebee shippers, we, we don't see all that. We just see the moments between her and Yang. But really, if you watch it going going all the way through, Team Ruby saved Blake in so many ways. Um, each, If you look at it really, each one of Team Ruby contributed to something to saving her. Yeah. We've got Yang, which is the Bumblebee part, but then we've got Weiss and Ruby that each contributed something too. Like, so it really is overall Team Ruby did bring this bring that back that side out of her again yeah. and make her herself. And whether it be a sisterly bond blooming between her and Ruby to Weiss and her um, overcoming what at the beginning of the series was a very big rift, Weiss being a Schnee, Blake being a Faunus, and them being close enough friends to where Weiss considers Blake part of her family, to the romance that has been um, slowly burning between her and Yang, each facet is a building block to build Blake back up from where she was at, in Volume 1, to where we now are in Volume 8. And really, if you watch closely from Volume 1, it is a completely different character compared to Volume 8. So much so that Aaron wishes she could go back and revoice a lot of the early volumes. Which I guess in Ice Queendom, she kind of got her ch a chance because if you watch the trailer for the English dub... Aaron is really voicing it differently. Blake sounds a good bit different than she did in Volume 1. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait until the 25th. Hopefully everything goes right, because Rooster, Rooster Teeth has still not told us if it's going to be safe to react to, but other channels have reacted to the Japanese version, and their videos are still up, and some of them are smaller than we are, so here's hoping. But, um... Is there anything you really else wanted to talk about, Blake, as far as stuff that we've not talked about before? Because we've done, like, We've really... done a lot of videos, so that's what I'm trying to think of. There's really something, like... Because we've, we've talked about the abuse. We've talked about, um, and uh, like that, and other things in other videos, so... Well, I mean, the only new thing with that, is that like, that I brought up already is, um... The thing where people say that she shouldn't have slapped Sun, which really, if you look back, the way what Adam did to her, the walls she put around her, it was a trigger moment for her that came out because of that. So that's the only new thing, I guess you could say I can add. I yeah. mean, other than that, we've covered pretty much everything. Yeah. Because, I mean, like I so said... So far. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah, because, like I said, Blake is a little bit easier to cover because, for one, we've covered it so many times. But, like, it's just really easy to, to watch her change from Volume 1 to Volume 8. Where, I guess in a lot of ways, Weiss's was a little bit more subdued, so it needs to be covered a bit more. Plus, there was a lot of moments for Weiss. Um, Ruby was also not as long as because Ruby, in a way, yes, hasn't changed as much as the others, but she has changed. Um, and they're all, I mean, overall, at this point, this is, you know, how far they've come. They've still got a long way to go. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll have another uh, video to do after a couple volumes, too. Yeah, <laughs> depending on how, how much longer it's going to be. But, um, so yeah, that I think that's a good stop, stopping point for Blake. Um, Yang will be next. That'll be the last one until more volumes go on. Um, I'll have fun with that because Yang is my favorite <laughs> character. And uh, so, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, click that like button, leave a comment. As always, guys, this is Kanan. This is Jesse. We love you all very, very much. Stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves, and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.